Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Mayojas. Uh, briefly to introduce myself, I'm an artist in the NFT space. Uh, going back to 2015, when I did a project where I forked Bitcoin, called it Bitchcoin, and <laughs> backed it at a fixed rate by my photography before the launch of Ethereum, making it a proto NFT. And I have since worked in lots of other mediums. And, um, and I have worked with Christy, Sotheby's, and OpenSea. Yes. And so I'm delighted to be asking these questions. So for all of you, um, will you all briefly introduce yourselves and tell us what firm you're representing and what your experience in the art world has been to this point? I can start. Hi, everyone. I'm Lydia. Is my mic on? Hi. Hello? Hi, I'm Lydia. I'm from Christie's. I'm part of the digital art team at Christie's. So I deal with everything from art curation, artists, client management, working on the development of our Christie's 3.0 on-chain platform, and everything else that involves NFTs at auctions that comes through Christie's. And yeah, it's been quite interesting. Um, my experience at Christie's started in the impressionist department, so very different, but I have a background in trading. I used to trade um, interest rates and FX rates before I joined the art world. So when I was asked to join the NFT group, it was kind of right in my alley to do so. And it's been kind of a wild ride since I joined a year ago and seeing the market develop. So I'm uh, Michael Bohana, I work at Sotheby's. So for those who maybe don't know or are not familiar with Sotheby's, uh, it's a, a leading auction house who's very specialized in selling very exclusive and unique items from many different categories, from collectibles, um, impressionist and modern, contemporary, watches, jewelry. We have over 30 different departments and, um, and 52 offices around the world. Um, and I've, uh, I, I, uh, I lead the, the NFT and digital art department, so I'm really in charge of selecting the right projects to take on Sotheby's and also the, the more longer strategy for Sotheby's in this space. I started eight years ago at Sotheby's in London as a um, contemporary art specialist, where I headed contemporary art sales. So I was in charge of appraisal artworks, advising our clients on selling or buying, and sourcing artworks for our auctions. I've done that also in Paris. And then in April 21, I introduced the first NFT sales at, uh, at Sotheby's, uh, where we really started to build a more uh, a stronger strategy within this space. Hey everyone, I'm Shiva and I am at OpenSea focused primarily on shifting us from the secondary market as a marketplace to the primary. So that means building relationships with creators, creating more surface area on our product so people can express themselves with rich storytelling and figuring out new business models or utility and how to express that in the product so we're much more accessible to the next million users. And prior to this, I worked in a lot of different platforms that basically helped creators realize their full potential. So places like YouTube and Spotify, but really intrigued by Web3, largely because it's presented the opportunity for people not only to control their own artistic creations and distribution, but also the business models they put behind that. And that's really exciting. So tell us, and this is particularly particularly for Sotheby's and Christie's. Tell us about the volume that you see on your platforms in digital art sales as a percentage of overall sales, and what you view as the role of a traditional auction house in digital art as sales fluctuate in popularity. Yeah, I'm happy to start. So to give an idea, in 2021, we sold for a bit above uh, 7 billion in uh, volume of sales, but across all departments at Sotheby's and globally. Um, and that same year we've done with only NFTs and digital art, 120 million uh, volume of sales. So it's uh, in volume, it's a small uh, percentage of the total uh, sales of Sotheby's, but it's a category for, for which the company really see a, um, an important, uh, important opportunity uh, for multiple reasons. First, the new category, the new profile of our clients that is younger, more tech-related, more crypto-related. Uh, and uh, we always, like through many innovations we've done in the past years, we try to capture a younger generation. So we really believe that with this new movement, 
the digital arts and uh, NFTs, uh, we capture like a whole new culture, a new generation of collectors that tomorrow uh, will be uh, way more important. So uh, we have uh, many different strategies through Sotbiz.com, Sotbiz Metaverse, a NFT dedicated platform um, fully on chain. And, um, and yeah. Yeah, so like Michael said, the digital art group is definitely a smaller division with the contemporary art group and much newer. Um, we really started growing just, just over two years ago. Um, I believe it was actually just March 11th that was the two years anniversary of the Beeple's Everydays, which sold for roughly $69 million. So really since then, um, we've really been developing our strategy and growing the business to be scalable, not just within contemporary art, but all across Christie's, whether that's introducing NFTs to the luxury department, books and manuscripts and photo. And in October, we launched our Christie's throughput on on-chain platform, which is an entirely new platform just for digital art and NFT auctions. So moving forward, we're really hoping to support emerging artists, established artists, various projects, and we'll have drops almost every other month. Um, and yeah, that's primarily our role, I think, in, in the space. We really want to be there to support artists and give them a platform to show their new projects, do drops, and, and more. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, can you all talk a bit more about how you help protect your customers when it comes to transacting on the blockchain and how tools like Chainalysis help uh, build customer trust? Mm -hmm. I can start. Um, so one thing about OpenSea is we see ourselves as a kind of a friendly and accessible veneer on top of the blockchain. Blockchain presents a lot of freedoms. You know, with that freedom comes a lot of power. And that power can get you into trouble if you don't know what you're doing. So we create, we kind of think of this as like, hey, we're a nice on-ramp to a system that could be very complicated. So the things we do, like any open system, is that we need to protect against what can happen in an open system, which is if spam happens, like, do we filter it out? Those are things we're working on. Can we work with the wallet ecosystem so that we can give you more plain speak warnings about things that might be you know, potentially precipitous if you're not careful? And what are the other types of things we can do so that we can start to detect transactions and see if they look peculiar to us, then we can start to freeze those transactions until people release them. So we've been doing a lot of this in the world of like, particularly around theft, but also just understanding who's real and who's not with verification and trying to be like that type of blanket on top of the space. So when it comes to chain, anal chain analysis, part of this is how do we get that signal that we can use to be better at these things? And can that signal be trained across the entire blockchain ecosystem independent of OpenSea so we can use it productively? That's where we focus on working with partners like that. Yeah, and I think at Sotheby's trust is the part of our DNA. When someone purchase an artwork, he has the guarantee of uh, the, the work to be authentic, that the process will follow the highest standard. Uh, also, to be uh, to have the auction house to be very transparent on the condi on the current condition of the artwork, etc. And with NFTs, we had to follow the same higher standard, and I think it and it helps many actually like traditional clients who wanted to dive into NFTs, like to purchase in a more um, in a, on a marketplace with a brand that they already know, they trust, and um, and so our use of chain analysis is also uh, very important especially to meet all our requirements in terms of KYC and MNL. Yeah, KYC at Christie's is very important and necessary whenever a client completes a purchase at Christie's. So, you know, when we, when we launched the on-chain platform, we needed a way to vet all the new users and the wallets that will sign up on uh, Christie's 3.0. And chain analysis has been great. We work very closely with chain analysis and the Christie's compliance team to vet every wallet that signs up onto the platform. And I think a really interesting statistic is that, you know, out of the out of the many wallets that have connected thus far in October, 
chain analysis basically shows the level of risk. Um, they, they run these wallets through their platform and the show a low risk, a medium risk, or high risk, and we have yet to see anything other than a low risk of SAR, so it's an interesting statistic. This next question is for OpenSea. Um, as NFT marketplaces compete, and specifically around royalties, exclusive listings, and transaction fees, how do you look at differentiating yourself to retain existing users and attract new users? Yeah, it's been, a, it's been a wild year. So we've seen two different populations emerge. And the way we think of those populations is folks who are super active. It's a very concentrated base of people right now who are largely buying and selling NFTs at volume. So for us, these are the pros. And then we have the next million. And I think we're still on a quest to get the next million into like the ecosystem and make sure that they understand what's going on they still value the aspects of ownership and transparency around that ownership, but also portability. But we want to see new use cases develop that take advantage of those primitives. But that experience is very different than coming into effectively something that is blinking lights and alerts all day versus something that's guiding you through your first purchase. So what you'll see us doing starting today is that we've effectively got two products in the mix. One is OpenSea Pro and OpenSea. OpenSea will shift to working closely with creators, giving them more storytelling options, sight, sound, and motion to reach that mainstream user, and then be able to do that with a credit card or their bank account versus knowing anything about crypto. Whereas on the other side, we'll work with folks who are really prize liquidity and need tools to manage that liquidity. And that forking of the user base, we think, is an exciting thing to pursue. And for Celebes and Christie's, what are the biggest challenges that you face when you look at pivoting to sales that are instantaneous and frequently traded rather than, say, a painting that comes up for sale once every 75 years? Um, like in Contemporary they actually trade mo much more than uh, every 75 years. Uh, but uh, for sure, like it's very unique for us to see the same work being that could be even like traded three times on the same day. It affects the price. It uh, it changes also the perception of the market uh, because it's very speculative. So it it was very challenging for us, I think, to navigate through a very fast moving market when we we take time actually for curation, to price, to evaluate the quality of the works, and and that's actually the market moves faster than that. So we had to really put ourselves in a position where we can uh, move very quick in accelerating all our process in terms of onboarding clients, uh, on um, consigning works, and selling them. Um, and um, also what was very interesting, challenging, but extremely interesting for us is that traditionally auction houses operate only on the secondary market. It's a, a bit in respect of the ecosystem in traditional art where you have the galleries that, uh, t that uh, manage and represent the artist, then you have the auction houses and the dealers who do secondary market and the museum who do curation and education. And uh, this ecosystem in, in the digital art space, NFTs, is like still a bit forming. It's still unsure who's like what, which actor should be placed where in this ecosystem. And I think quite naturally, we actually started to do a lot of first market working directly with artists. So we have artist liaison in our team who can who know and have the experience in working with artists and guiding them through the process of creating uh, and go to market with their work. Uh, and that's for us, it's like a huge privilege to work directly with artists and then to, uh, to be able also to better translate to our collectors on the importance of certain work because we've been closer actually to the creation process. Um, I actually think there, there are definitely challenges, but I think there are a lot of benefits too in the way that these, we know, transactions and um, these new transactions in Web3 and how they're involved with art have provided for our clients. For me, I, I think that you know, a lot of the feedback we heard from clients prior to um, us building an on-chain platform was a lot of the tedious post-sale processes and due diligence that would come, say, when you dealt with a, a rare painting that would only come to, when you come to market every 75 years or so. And I also think there's a misconception that 
um, with transactions in NFTs and digital art, maybe because of how quick and transparent everything is, collectors might not explore all the due diligence check boxes as with a traditional painting. But I'd say, you know, in my conversations with our clients and collectors, that's not always true. And um, there are there are quite a collect few of collectors that are holding on to dearly their their special pieces. And I think it will be years before before they're traded and, and sold, actually. And if I can add also just on the fact that it's um, it's very, like the works trade a lot. Actually, there is a, a bit different categories in the NFT space where we see the collectibles, all the PFPs, etc. And where we see more volume, there is more supply and maybe also a lower uh, average price per works. So it, it uh, helps also the higher level of trades. But uh, you have also like digital art with the uh, artist making one of one NFTs. Like it takes sometimes two, three weeks, uh, even more to make a, a single work. And then their pool of collectors, it's like truly believers and amateurs of uh, digital art and don't really trade so, so much like this, more or less liquid uh, one of ones. And th this is for this category, I think, where we are very close actually to the contemporary art in terms of the behavior of the collectors, the artists. And also now the gallery, there are a couple of galleries in the space making a great work actually in onboarding this new uh, and young digital artist in the, in the space. Mm -hmm. And so the next question is, what do you think the new kinds of experiences uh, Web3 will enable for art collectors? Uh, and specifically, how will the visibility and transparency of blockchains improve the commercial outcomes for artists and collectors? That's a good question. Um, a company that I have been following recently is called Bright Moments. I think they do something that's really special in the space is where they bring the artists to tour in all of their various Bright Moments global spaces. And the collectors, after they participate in the initial mint online, they can come participate in, in real life IRL minting with artists. And so far, I think it's been very well, well received and a success. And yeah, that's, um, that's something special, I think, that collectors have been really enjoying and participating in this kind of IRL minting experience with, with Bright Moments. And I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? The visibility and transparency. Yeah, visibility and transparency. I think you know that is a huge added benefit to to the art world. Um, I think you know traditionally, I think visibility and transparency is something you could definitely say the traditional art world was lacking before getting involved and in bringing Web three into the space. And it's only um, it's only helpful for collectors to see very clearly certain transactions that have been taking on prices. And you know this is all something that you can see, which is the beauty of uh, Web3 and the beauty of blockchain. And I think uh, the, um, like the behavior and the experience for the collectors evolved a lot since 21 and today's. Um, mainly because uh, like it's, it's very less speculative in the market and you have uh, you start to see like an important pool of collectors uh, collecting works and interested in actually hanging them at home, getting them printed or properly displayed. And in the meantime, there have been like a great um, innovation and uh, development made in, like, in order to properly display digital works at home. Um, and so I think we start to see uh, collectors really behaving like collecting contemporary art and enjoying the same type of experience. And it goes also along with the, the way then the collectors are, and with the transparency of the blockchain, are very we can identify very easily the collectors of certain artists. And then these artists leverage that in order to give them access to their next uh, exhibition, in real life exhibition or a dinner. And they use it as a, as a CRM, the same way a gallery would, uh, would work. So it's interesting to see that. And I think it helped also these collectors to be way more active in collecting. Uh, it means defending on social media, really showcasing their works on the metaverse or physical. And uh, I, we saw also through the past 18 months, these collectors becoming almost like a gallery in the way they process. They created a vitrine, a website, where you can see their, uh, the, the artists they collect. Uh, the world, uh, some information about their artists, and 
Uh, we've seen like a few collectors like really playing now the role of a gallery, even like going into selling the artworks of their uh, their artists. So it's interesting to see this evolving with the collectors taking actually a very important part of the the ecosystem. Yeah, I geek out most on the transparency side of it, which is, you know, if you look at the prior worlds, right? Like curation has always been a very important part of discovery of art. Galleries played that role for a while, but often those relationships were private or the most meaningful connections were from private collectors. Now we've got a world where you've got a digital asset out there, people buy it, and you can start to score that graph around it. So we kind of have a, like an interesting like Google page rank for curators that's completely public out there. And hopefully that democratizes the ability for a lot of artists to like escape sooner in their careers because you can see people who've selected them, collected them, and start to score that in interesting ways and say, wow, this might be someone I want to pay attention to because she's awesome and a lot of other people think she's awesome and I'm a part of that community by collecting that art. That transparency could be really interesting if we build the right experiences around it. So that's what's fun for me. The last question is a bit of a pie in the sky question. Um, and so, and it's about AI. Uh, so, how do you think that attribution for art should work with generative models that use artists' work to train on and then produce works that look very similar? Do you think that there will be a platform-based solution for attribution? Do you think there could be a cryptographic solution to this? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, um, I don't have fully formed thoughts, which is yeah. why it's a question. I think that there is no, with these models like Midjourney, Dali, that are an undeniably a step forward in terms of a tool for creation, there's no way to ethically source that content. Um, just, just their existence is a huge copyright violation. And the, you know, the issue is mostly in my eyes when you have in the style of yeah. Miyazaki, right? There was a huge amount of resources yeah. uh, devoted to creating that, that style, and now anybody else can do it. And so I think that there should be some sort of solution, either within how the model is trained and be able to like isolate those images, um, or that every time you know someone in the text prompt puts in the style of X, yeah. right? part of whatever revenue should cryptographically, like sure. should maybe on chain get returned to the original creator who cited as a specific style. But I am really- yeah. <laughs> Problem solved, yeah. yeah. I don't, I, like, <clears throat> I think it's not new at all in contemporary art uh, since yeah. actually early 20th century that artists use existing even like items or just like existing works from other artists to reappropriate them the works and make like a new work signed by them and um, we have the example of Richard Prince who's like it was uh, there have been some controversy around him but he's been uh, using photographs from other like from advertising that he doesn't own but like using as his own work of art but then because it's in a different context and he signs it it becomes a work of art and and uh, and escape a bit all these holes he tried uh, but I, like, I think it's not new and there is like a whole movement in uh, like that is called like reappropriation art where you have artists who their only concept is like copying a work by Andy Warhol, let's say, but just making it very, very small, like seven centimeters, three inches uh, big. And it's conceptual, it's just an image of a, a replica of a Warhol, but it's a work by another artist. And I think it's actually very interesting and using other artists works as an influence or as a tool, as a medium, been there like for a very long time. So it needs to be framed and understand. And also we need to know how to describe it, uh, um, like, to, like to describe it when we sell it, for example, or present it. But uh, it's not new for me and just need like to, to be more legally framed somehow. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree. And you know, think about Think about Richard Prince, um, you know, a very successful artist, you know, known for some of his his appropriation work. So this this kind of issue and this problem is really not new. But in the way that AI um, is involved with, you know, taking you know IP and copyright and 
I think there's issues that are raised in the news kind of every day surrounding the, the hot topic of AI and AI art, which is extremely popular right now. And I think, you know, there are some hesitations and, and people are wary to, to get involved. And I think that may be why AI art, um, the prices you see aren't just aren't up there compared to something like, like generative art, for example. So yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, it's an interesting and very good question. And I'm not really sure what the solution is, but going forward. Yeah, I look at it as like there's a real positive force where there's a lot of stories locked in people's heads now who can't bring them to life. So for those people, AI is a superpower, right? I can have a really interesting idea. It's something I can imagine, but I can't craft it. And I, this might be able to help me craft it. On the other side, you know, an AI at the end of the day, it looks at anything out there. And once it sees it, it's going to create it. Right. And this is like the biggest form of infringement that can happen. So in this world, I think both of them benefit if there's some way on chain, we can take proof of original authorship and make that a record that can be used for different things. I think it's also pretty cool if that does turn into a business model, because if you're a really interesting emerging artist and you've created a new style and that style might be very trendy. Right. You want as many people to use it in that short period of time. Just like you know, an actor that might be very trendy wants to get as many movies in that next three years that really matter. That's really key to your sustainable income. So if there's a way you can get paid for that and you can prove that original authorship, I think it becomes an exciting new marketplace that we know artists need for sustainable living.